Um, St. Lucia participated in the ECCB um, netball tournament in Antigua, um, and I was very, very happy to be invited uh, to that tournament, first of all, to see uh, the progress that we've been making in netball, and uh, also to have some meetings with members of the Cricket West Indies board, considering that we are getting ready to host the ICC Cricket World Cup. Um, the girls, they fared well in some of the games, uh, some others not so much. St. Lucia finished fourth in the tournament. Um, but the, the ambition is to ensure that St. Lucia hosts the ECCB netball tournament, the regional tournament, next year. And so I was able to uh, spend some time with the Minister of Sport in Antigua, some time with the persons from the Netball Association in Antigua, see what was good, what we can replicate and how we can make the tournament uh, one of the best that we've ever had in recent times. And so I'm enthusiastic about uh, netball development. The girls are back on island. There are a lot of things that we have to sit at the table and discuss, but I'm very confident that St. Lucia will have a better show in next year. With regards to the conversations with uh, Cricket West Indies, uh, a lot was discussed in terms of St. Lucia's preparation for hosting the event. As we know, Darren Sami is uh, one of the most sought after uh, stadiums in the world. Uh, not just because of Darren Sami, but because St. Lucia have all the dynamics of hosting a global event in terms of the rooms, availability of rooms for fans who will be traveling to, to and from St. Lucia, in terms of the logistics of the Cricket Association, in terms of our track, re track record. St. Lucia has always hosted a successful global event and we are certainly looking forward to doing that again. How many matches that St. Lucia getting? For now, uh, we have a situation where the fixtures are not out as yet. Cricket West Indies have indicated that they will be um, putting the fixtures out in November. So next month I would have a more accurate answer for you in terms of the amount of games St. Lucia will be hosting. But the number is set at about five for now. Um, St. Lucia will be hosting the Super 8. Um, and the Super 8 uh, pretty much is another round robin after the initial round robin and so we're expecting to host uh, quite a few games in St. Lucia but the exact number we do not have that as we currently speak. I'm aware that there were some drainage issues at the stadium. Um, any plans to, to fix it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? Can we get any updates on that? Well the drainage system as with a lot of things at the Darren Sami was installed in 2001 which would mean that would be 22 years ago. Um, technology has pretty much gone ahead. Uh, we've seen a lot of the recent stadia being equipped with a different form of drainage. Uh, we are, uh, the, the funny thing is we had already earmarked the Darren Zami for an upgrade. And so we received the costing and the work is expected to start in November on the drainage system and the surface of the Darren Zami ahead of the cricket tournament. While we, we speak about some of the upgrades, the lighting system is also expected to be upgraded at the Darren Sami, um, simply because, again, this was installed in 2001, which is 22 years ago. And as you would know, if lights, the burning from inside would, ca would cause the yellowing, um, or I would say oranging of the external lights, which would make it dimmer over time. And so, as a Minister for Youth Development and Sport, I've always been uh, one on record to say that we have to move into LED um, lighting at all of our stadia, and then, uh, of course, move into alternative forms of energy. And so we will be seeing an upgrade of the lighting at the Darren Sammy as well. Um, okay, back on the, the cricket, what's the cost in Antigua? I know they've been, they've been concerned. In Antigua, they did not because they seem to have cost in terms of what's the notion of benefits? Jamaica was the one who did not. Um, well, if you look at Jamaica, comparing Jamaica and St. Lucia in this time in history in terms of, of, of their, their sports tourism product, um, I think Jamaica's government would have been comfortable with foregoing this World Cup considering the, the successes. St. Lucia has recently started um, having uh, amazing successes in terms of the achievement on the global scene as it pertains to our sports tourism product with Julian Alfred. And of course, we are seeing Naomi breaking in and uh, some of the other individuals being global stars. So I think Jamaica's position was that they did not think at that time that the cost-benefit analysis were in their favor. St. Lucia, considering 
uh, our burgeoning economy and the, the strides we've made in tourism, we are of the position that uh, there are tremendous benefits to St. Lucia for hosting this event. We're talking about almost two billion people or two billion pairs of eyes being on Sweet St. Lucia during especially the Super 8 uh, component of the competition. And so we're expecting tremendous benefits in terms of uh, visibility for St. Lucia. And that is why we made that decision. In terms of the cost, um, we are still putting the final figures together in terms of the upgrades to the playing field and the surrounding areas. But again, considering the stadium has been in, in existence for 22 years, those upgrades were bound to come at some point. And so we are very confident that uh, the upgrades that we are making and the finances that we are going to pump into the Darren Sami and of course the Grosley playing field and the Mindo Philip Park as training grounds would augur well for our sportsmen and women and for St. Lucia as a whole. Also, um, I am aware that the government had plans to um, semi-professionalize football. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any updates on that? I know that the national team has been doing very well as of recent times. Yes, um, I have to congratulate our football team, both male and female, for the strides we are making in football. I can tell you the feeling when you speak to young people who are actually um, in football right now and uh, it, it is very positive considering that this government came in with the ambition of ensuring that we semi-professionalize football. So a lot of persons are looking towards football as an alternative way of getting an income. Um, we've had meetings, a number of meetings with the St. Lucia Football Association. We are expecting that uh, very soon for uh, the marketing and promotion of the, the semi-professional league to commence. Um, we have a challenge um, considering that we won the bid and it took quite a while, Cricket West Indies took quite a while before announcing that St. Lucia was indeed one of the venues for the ICC. So the, the ambition was to launch the semi-professional league at the Mendo Philip Park. And so now the Mendo Philip Park will be closed for renovations. And so in terms of venues, uh, we have to have North, South, East and West for the semi-pro league. And so we've been at the table trying to ensure that we can have that complete. The Prime Minister has made the financing available for the Semi-Pro League, so we're hoping for a start very early next year. Would futsal be considered as um, an additional component? I know that, that futsal is an is a event at, at Olympics and this type of thing, so would futsal be considered as well? Very good question, my brother. I think futsal, as with, if you look at all sporting events, you look at volleyball, you have a two and two component. You look at cricket, you move away from, I, I shouldn't say move away, but we've graduated from tests to one days to now T20. You know, there's a fast five in, in netball, there's a, 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 a rugby seven. So all versions of sport, given, I guess, I guess the attention span of people seem to have been truncated in some way. And so futsal is one of the truncations made um, in sport. Uh, as a minister, I can tell you, Futsal brings in a lot of uh, commercial value and excitement. Currently, the commercial sector has taken on, on Futsal. And as a government, I don't, I don't think necessarily that we need to interfere with, with no private sector development in sport. We want to encourage the private sector to come up with those sort of food, those sort of events so that they can generate some income and pass it on to consumers whether for vending whether for payment of athletes and so we're very happy with this development we've seen in futsal um, in terms of uh, uh, let's just say a, co a company like black heart or um, you know any other company deciding to invest in in futsal they would have the backing of this government 100 percent but we would not be the forerunners of the development of futsal in st lucia but what's new in your constituency? All right, so the constituency of Grosley, as you can see, has been under some uh, major infrastructural development. And of course, we are very proud of some of the social events that we have ongoing in terms of programs in our community. Um, you would have seen recently the community of um, Beauceju being given attention. This is after 20 odd years of pretty much patching and patching of roads in Beauceju, a real comprehensive road network program. Um, has been earmarked for Beauceju. Um, we've started on most of the roads. We're expecting about 90% of the roads to be given some form of attention currently, and then later on the further 10%. The ambition is to have to give Beauceju what they deserve, and that's a proper road network. Um, the contractor has been faced with some challenges, sometimes with uh, vehicles parked on the side of the road, as you would have seen, and sometimes uh, with uh, weather patterns uh, disallowing for the flow of work 
uh, but the project is ongoing and uh, we're expecting that Boseju uh, by the end of the year to be almost uh, complete in terms of the development of the road network and uh, we are going to be moving on to Kazaba and the Mont Souton to a Rivermita Bridge project. Um, we also have a, a number of social programs uh, happening in Grosley. For the first time in our history, we were able to implement a virtual constituency day. I think it was the first in St. Lucia's history. Given the fact that I was out for a while, what we decided to do was to uh, pretty much wherever in the world I was, connect via Zoom and allow people to come in the office regularly and have conversations with the MP so that he could provide some assistance to them. Uh, with our first edition of Virtual Constituency Day, almost 90% of the requests, I can proudly say, uh, of our constituents who met, we were able to contact them immediately when upon my return and uh, we've been getting some positive feedback for, from constituents. We also have a program that we are going to implement very soon called Dress for Success, where we're inviting the entire diaspora and individuals in, let's just say, all walks of life to provide the clothing that they may not be interested in using anymore um, to young persons that come to the office that are looking for jobs, that have landed an interview but really do not have the means, uh, considering they are unemployed in the first place, to have a proper shirt, tie, pants, and uh, in some instances, uh, dress and that sort of thing. So. We are encouraging all of the public to come forth with uh, some of the clothing that they are no longer using because we know as human beings our weight fluctuates so some of us may be a little heavier and would have left the clothing that we used to use in the, in, in the drawers and some of us would have lost some weight and so we are inviting everybody to uh, drop off the clothing at the Grosley HRDC so that we can commence the program and provide that opportunity for our young people. So there's a lot happening in Grosley. Um, uh, is there public housing coming to Grosley? Yes, there's also public housing, the rent to own program, the National Housing Corporation and the Ministry of Housing. Uh, the first project will be built in Grosley and we're hoping that very early next year in Kazaba, uh, we'll see that building go up uh, to give persons who are of a middle to lower income the opportunity to to own at least a flat um, during uh, the next year. Now, this is one of the campaign promises that I made uh, without even having a conversation with the Minister of Housing uh, before we got into government. And I'm very proud of the fact that we are going to take that off as another achievement in the constituency of Grosley. Kasaba, Kasaba. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, my man. <laughs> when you say Wayne Bruce, um, okay, so Kazaba, okay, so I, I, I guess I understand what you're asking. Uh, the Trim Stadium, you would have to go straight down towards the beach. Straight down towards the beach. You see, there's no other road to describe it. So, that, <laughs> so the Trim, you continue all the way down. Uh, as a matter of fact, the road development is going to commence, and then, of course, that um, rent to own program. Yes, finally for me, um, the CDB has a great so in the government of St. Michelle, a little over $20 million to support the youth economy. Are you pleased with the progress the agency has accomplished as well, or do you see that there is room for improvement? Very satisfied. All right, thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Yeah. Appreciate it. No if you can use the opportunity to talk about your, any updates in your portfolio. Yes. I know last week, the yeah. finance service was there's a signing ceremony for um, the in excess of 26 million to upgrade basically the entire mm -hmm. finance service. I think it's probably the biggest single injection into the finance service in a while. Yep. How do you anticipate that might benefit fire officers in the country in terms of national security? Okay. Um, well, um, the protective services, that is a, a department that um, we felt had been neglected for a while in terms of the resources that they needed to carry out their duties. And one of them is the St. Lucia Fire Service. And you will be aware that during the time of COVID, the fire service played a tremendous role in saving people's lives and rescuing people in all different parts of St. Lucia. And therefore, the equipment that they had and they still continue to use, has suffered some serious wear and tear. 
and government felt it was necessary that we get some new equipment for these officers to carry out their duties and it is well received by them. They will be getting some fire trucks, they will also be receiving some ambulances as well as fire drone for the airport. We also have incorporated in that project where we got um, to the tune of 9.9 .9 million US dollars, about 26 million um, EC dollars that will be um, secured for these activities. The fire officers will get um, support for training and government is in the process of establishing uh, uh, an advanced training institute for the protective services. Because what we have seen is that um, police have the training, fire have the training, um, correctional officers have the training. So we are using the training school in Viewfort, where government has acquired additional land to build a complex for training for all the protective services. So that too will be incorporated in this project. And there are other equipment that we felt that the fire officers needed for them to, to carry out their duties. I know some of them, their expectations are still a little higher because we are already working on a feasibility study to look at the headquarters for the fire service. So that too is on the cards for government to begin to look at. And um, government is very appreciative of the work of the fire service, especially as you see they actually engage in a lot of preventative measures to avoid fires and even to protect homes that are caught um, by fire. But the issue of emergency medical technician who played that role during COVID and anytime there is an accident, sometimes murder, they are among the first to be on site to see what they can do. And therefore we have to give them the tools they need for them to be efficient and effective in carrying out their duties. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, um, earlier this year, there was a statement that was put out by the fire chief. I believe when they were talking about the stresses of the fire department, and they also mentioned the yes, sorry, press briefing, my bad. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the what they stated was that currently, right now, there's a lot of trauma, mental trauma, and um, mental illness. Sorry, when it comes to the when it comes to dealing with different situations in the fire department when they go out to the emergency. So I don't think there's any mental um, mental precautions that put in place, some type of therapy or whatnot that are being introduced for the benefits. Um, well, that project too will address um, appointing somebody to deal with psychosocial problems um, affecting persons in the protective services. And many times they, they try to access the services that are provided by um, the, the public service. And they find that the, the waiting period is too long and therefore they will need their own officer, their own personnel to handle psychosocial problems. And they do experience some traumatic situations and they need uh, immediate attention. So that too is incorporated in that project. Mm -hmm. Okay, Madam Minister, um, I don't know if you are you know, effective today Bill conditions for criminals will now need a, a police certificate. Do you believe that this will help in, sort of in, 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 in those, the crime that's happening? Do you think it's an it's a added um, tool to help better fight um, crime? Um, putting the bill conditions of anybody being charged, um, if I think that they need a police certificate, what's your thoughts on this? Or if you have other about this? Um, well, I don't have full detail on and the operations of this initiative. But as you may be aware, that government right now is looking at improving the security and intelligence measures in handling crime. There are a number of initiatives that we are taking. And one of the things that we have stressed, especially when it comes to the police force, is that they are actually looking at rebranding the police force. And so that the, the community can have greater rapport with the police. As you know, the, the people, the general public, they are the biggest crime fighters. And if they cooperate with the police, it will make life a lot easier. So measures like um, the conditions for, for bail and other issues, these are some of the things that we want to put in place to enhance the way we administer justice in this country. And um, the, the police 
right now there are a lot of more sophisticated um, equipment that they will use in in fighting crime we are looking at the issue of intelligence using a lot of intelligence to fight crime and then we want to accelerate and expand what we call the community relations community t policing where people don't see the police as a threat but more as a partner in in keeping the country safe and secure so the the point that you raise is one where we want to begin to refine a lot of what we are doing in administering justice crime and security matters in St. Lucia. And on, on that note, um, over the weekend, the, the United Lucas Party had a political um, uh, rally, basically. And one of the issues came out where one of the agency did indicate that um, threatening and taking the figure of police and threatening and threatening police. Do you think it all goes well for the justice setting for St. Lucia, where political operatives are threatening police? Uh, well, as you know, there are a number of little innuendos and threats that are issued around the place. And these are things that the police need to pay close attention to. Because sometimes people dismiss these things as, oh, it's just a rally or somebody has said something. But we can treat it as a form of threat to the police, where if the police is carrying out their duties and somebody felt that they were not satisfied with the decision of the police that they could put their photos or their names on record for further forms of reprisal or action against them. This I find is not correct, it is not acceptable, and our law enforcement officers are also paying close attention to the individuals who are actually articulating these um, expressions. So what message would you like to send out to them? Well, I need to um, tell persons that too many times we see the police as our adversaries. The police are supposed to be the friend of the people because they are there to protect them. And if we begin to change our attitude towards the police, we will get a lot more out of them rather than the confrontational aspect. If we can relate the policemen who work in St. Lucia, they are um, both men and women. They are mothers, they are fathers, they are husbands, they are sons. So they are human beings that live in our society. And let us treat them as that and work with them so that they carry out their duties. One of the things I have articulated is some people do not understand the scope of work of the police officers and the length and breadth and the extent to which they go to protect St. Lucia. And I think it is the responsibility of the police to give public relations on the nature of the work that they do so people develop a greater appreciation. When these people have to go out there in the forest and carry out some raid, they are taking a chance with their lives in order to protect us in the middle of the night and we are at home sleeping. Do we really understand what that means? A police officer could easily say, I'm not going or I will not do it. But some of them do have the courage to go out there. And we need to applaud these officers for that kind of um, courage and sacrifice that they are making to keep our country safe and secure. Okay, and another note, um, recently the Bodily, can you just listen to some of the people what's happening in Bodily? You know of all the disturbance that they had. I know you all have done some interventions, you all have done the things. What are the latest with Bodily and how things are going? Well, right now things are fairly quiet at Bodily. Um, there was some sign of protest by some of the protective um, um, the correctional officers. They have since gone back to the, to the jobs and things are normal. And we are still continuing to invest heavily in Bodily. And right now, government is in the process and they have started the work to secure the outer fence at Bodily, which costs in the region of close to $6 million. This institution has been around for almost 20 years and it has never received any serious infrastructural um, work in terms of repair and many things were falling apart. Um, the, the place is exposed to the sea blast and a lot of things were getting rusty, falling apart and so on. And this government here um, under the leadership of the Prime Minister has committed quite a bit of funds. Um, we are actually um, halfway within this financial year and we can see that we have spent about $10 million at Bodily. 
to, to put in a number of security measures and to give the correctional officers the tools they need to carry out their work properly. And you had some concerns about the appointment. Well, recently I understood that you, your government recently reappointed the deputy and a number, made a number of appointments on a contract. I know they had some concerns with some officers about that. Um, well, again, as you know, at um, Bordele Correctional Facility, we have a new director. And before the director came in, we did a review of Bordele. And that review articulated what we had to do in a short-term period, medium-term, and long-term. And we did the short-term evaluation after the six months, because the short-term was for six months. And after the six months, we went into the permanent secretary, uh, myself as minister and a team, we went into Bordelay and we went through the recommendations, about 19 of them. And at the time, which was earlier this year, we had achieved about 90% of what we set out to do. So it was very clear that the government was achieving its objectives. And they had already started on some medium and long-term measures, for example, like the fencing and other security um, measures. In fact, we are trying to get um, radios for the correctional officers. And about 50 radios costs about $340,000. So it is something that is a very expensive operation. And it is one thing that I have always advised St. Lucians, that it is more cost effective. It is socially positive if people avoid crime, because it's a very expensive exercise for government to secure persons behind bars and to take care of them in a, hum in a humane fashion. So we are trying our best to prevent crime so that we have less persons at Bordelais. People were saying we need to secure the place, we need to fight crime. And since then they have arrested a lot more persons, which has brought in a lot of pressure on the institution to take care of all these people. In the past, um, some St. Lucians have questioned um, whether the work of justices of the peace are still necessary. It seems like every, every document that, that we have to do, get, um, whether it's passport or whatever, must be signed by these um, public servants. Question is, do you still believe that um, they are necessary? And if, if so, what is the value to the society? Okay, well, the Prime Minister and the Department of Justice they are the ones responsible for appointing justice of the peace. And after a while, we need to do an evaluation to see whether it is really serving the purpose. I have heard complaints that people said justice of the peace is not supposed to charge people for them to sign a document to verify whether it is authentic. And if that is the law, are we having persons who have to keep the law breaking the law? So these are some of the issues that are raised. But again, you will see the person had to use a stamp, they had to use paper, they had to use their time, don't you feel it is fair to compensate them for, for that resource that people are actually accessing? So it is one that, as you mentioned, we may have to ask the government to do an evaluation to see whether it is actually serving its purpose. But I want to draw briefly to your attention that um, there was, while we were speaking on the police force, um, there are a few sessions going on right now in the police force. And it is basically looking at the issue of gender. And um, today and tomorrow, there is a session with all the female officers at, um, at the Harbour Club Hotel. And I'm supposed to address them there on how, what happens in the workplace. As you know, most of the correctional um, units are dominated by males. It's more or less a male-dominated job. You have police, you have fire, you have um, correctional, you have a, much, um, a, a very small percentage of women who are attracted to these type of work. And there is issue in terms of how secure and how safe women feel going into the, the profession that is male dominated. So they have a session with all male um, police officers to discuss their challenges as male police officers and there is a session for female police officers to address some of the issues relating to them in the workplace. So I will be addressing them to look at the gender issues as it relates to the workplace in the protective services. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Minister, um, I know a lot of improvements have been made on 
terms of the processing of passports and whatnot, um, uh, where are we though on the relocation of the office? What's happening? Now? Okay, um, the relocation of the 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 immigration department. Um, I actually visited the site, so the place is ready. It looks very much enhanced and everything is in place. All the technology, electrical, everything is in place. However, um, the, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, you know when you move to a new location, you don't want to carry all your old desks and chairs in that new location. It's going to be um, a, a little um, disheartening to see, um, for those of you who haven't moved to a new home, you cannot take all your old beds and everything in the old home and bring it in the new home. It's going to degrade the environment. So what happened is that right now, we are actually securing new furniture for the police officers to move. But the building, the space is ready for them to move into the new location. Can you tell us where the space is? Um, I think it's public knowledge. Um, the space is... Um, um, Opposite the Laplace Carinage, that building upstairs there. Um, they used to say, how do you call it? Um, oh, wet and cold. Wet and cold. Mm -hmm. So the top floor, that is where they will be um, um, occupying. So they did the retrofitting. They have a lot more stations. They have waiting areas for the people to go in. They re did retrofitting of the steps to go up there. And it's a lot more conducive for persons to operate, and they will be moving in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, the Prime Minister has announced a zeroing of the ambulance fees. Could you tell us a thinking behind that? Um, you mean the fees that people have to pay when they call ambulance? Mm -hmm. And he asked them not to abuse it? Mm -hmm. Just like they're abusing the, the fat you remove on the pampas? <laughs> um, well, government has definitely tried to um, um, help out in the public. There are some people who cannot afford to pay. And when we put the zero, it means even if you can afford it or you cannot afford it, it is zero. So everybody benefits. So it is a big relief, especially for persons who cannot afford. And I don't know how long we can cap it if the Prime Minister will decide to see for the next year or two years or whether it is ongoing forever. But whatever fees that would be collected from that would be some revenue that government will forego. But it is in the interest of saving lives and providing health care and, and security for our people. So I think it's a very good move so that everybody will have equal access to the services provided by the ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, before you leave, we must have a statement you made earlier. You said that individuals have to change their approach when dealing with the police. But I think that many individuals will agree that some of our officers are very aggressive and that they actually need to change their approach when dealing with citizens. Wouldn't you say so? Um, yes, because we are not living in a perfect world. And when this government came in, we found that there was a zero allocation for training for police. We even found that a number of persons were recruited to the police force without any prior training. They were just dressed in uniform and they were on the road and doing policing. So that we find was an atrocity. You cannot have, this is a specialized unit. It's not something where you can go and do some reading and you get your CXC and you get your first degree in anything and the next day you're a police officer. It requires some special skills and at least you need that orientation before you come into the police force. And when we discovered that, government immediately put some allocation in the budget. Initially, we put about $300,000 to train the police officers and we have increased that. So really and truly, we have seen that training officers to carry out their work is critical. And one of them would be their attitude towards the public. How do they relate to people? And I believe to some extent that um, we find that um, we restrict ourselves to what we know in our environment. However, we need to give our persons, whether it's police, fire, persons in the public service, wherever you work, even in the media, you need to have exposure in terms of what's happening outside of St. Lucia. So we can compare. So you need exposure at the regional level. You need exposure at the international level. So you can come back and implement some of the best practices that you would have um, learned. So I believe that it is necessary for us to train our policemen, not just 
on what they see in St. Lucia, what they know, but what is happening in the other islands in the Caribbean and what's happening, whether it's in the UK, the US, Canada. So they come back with some fresh ideas to implement, to improve security, to improve safety. And that is how you raise the bar. You need a few of them that are above board so that they can pull up the others and say, no, this is not how we do things. This is how they do it over there and they are seeing results. Why don't we try this? But if they restrict themselves to only what they know, then it's, it's, it's like spinning top in mud. So I believe that it is necessary that we invest in training, developing the skills of officers so they can improve the quality of their performance. Is there any psychological screening that is done prior to them joining in addition to them meeting the requirements, educational requirements and whatnot, maybe strict requirements, but psychological evaluations of the people that are being recruited? Well, um, right now we are getting the, the recruitment and, and assignment of police officers to be a lot more sophisticated. And that is why I mentioned earlier that we are looking at rebranding the police force. And rebranding means a lot of things. And recently we have con concluded what we call a benchmark qualification for the protective services. We found that a lot of persons were promoted within these ranks based on certificates. And it's not just a master's in business administration or a master's in technology and so on. It's whether you have the skills, the experience, and the ability to do the work as specified. And therefore, um, the team of experts that designed and came up with the benchmark qualification, we are going to use it to determine whether you are moving up the ranks and what would qualify you and not so much how many certificates you have, what degree. That, is, that matters, but it's not the, the, the primary focus. The primary focus will be, are you fit? If you look at some police officers, they need to go to the gym. It's not anything, um, but you can say, how are you going to... I, I actually experienced a police officer ch chasing a criminal in Castries. And he couldn't catch up. So these are things that when they put you on the field to, to do certain work, that you are fit, you have the skills, you have the experience. And if your work is more for administration, they put you in the administration. So that's what we say. Do not put square pegs in round holes. Let us get the job done and make sure you're ready. So I think that, that will speak to what we mean by benchmark qualification, experience, skills, and abilities that will determine whether you move up the ranks, whether you are placed in this category or not, because we want results. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. All right. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everybody. I wanted to just mention a few things related to my trip to Costa Rica to attend the 22nd regular meeting of the Inter-Caribbean Board of Agriculture, IBA. And that meeting is really to bring, was really meant to bring all ministers of agriculture in the Caribbean and Latin America together to discuss the issues in agriculture. And you know, the agricultural sector is on the map these days because food security, food insecurity is becoming a major discussion, not just in St. Lucia, not just in the Caribbean, but a worldwide problem. Following this meeting, we again assemble in the Bahamas to attend the 17th meeting of the Caribbean Week of Agriculture. And during that week, from the 9th to the 13th of, of October, we were engaged in a number of meetings, especially with our partners like FAO. We had um, a meeting, a special meeting of the OECS Ministers Council. We met with the FAO partners to discuss agriculture. We had a meeting with the Board of Cardi. And we had a special meeting called the Quoted Meeting on Agriculture, which is the Council of Trade and Economic Development in terms of agriculture. And basically, food security, as I mentioned, the 25 by 2025 target that the region established in 2018 we are realizing that there are a number of factors that are creating challenges in terms of whether we are going to meet that target by the year 2025. One of you, you, you would understand the impact 
that climate change is having on the agricultural sector. And that is causing havoc, not just in the Caribbean, but in the region. We had COVID two years back, and you know, again, how it impacted the sector. But now we are seeing excessive heat in the Caribbean region. And even countries like Belize, they've seen a reduction in the yield of corn by 50% as a result of the excessive heat. This excessive heat, we need to be concerned about it because it will reduce yield of milk in cattle. You know, the, um, the, 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 the quantity or levels of meat production in cattle. But again, cattle need shades, cattle need a certain amount of grass. And as a result of the excessive heat, what it may cause is to ensure that persons with large farms will have to maybe invest in irrigation because if your cattle your your, your farms are, or your your grass areas are not healthy it means that it will reduce your level of production also we suspect insect pests that may not survive in pre heat conditions may be able to survive in the high excessive heat that we're experiencing now we also have a very serious matter on our hands in Hispaniola, places like Haiti and Dominican Republic. They are experiencing the African swine fever. And it is a serious concern for us in the Caribbean. What is happening that is a positive for our region is that it seemed to have been stationed in the Dominican Republic for a very long time. And we are not seeing a spread rapidly in the Caribbean, other Caribbean countries. The U.S. government came for the USAID, had a special meeting with ministers of agriculture whilst in the Bahamas, and they have indicated to give support. This African swine flu disease, there is no cure for it. And we are hoping that we will increase our surveillance. We will get more training of our staff to ensure our biosecurity, security at our ports, will do all that is necessary to avoid this disease from getting into, into the Caribbean. Because if that happens again, it's going to affect our food security, it's going to impact our food import bill, and our 25 by 25 will be again challenged. We would know what we did just recently with the TR4 in bananas. It is another disease. If we do not increase our, bio, our biosecurity, it will reach our ports and it can devastate the entire banana and planting subsectors in St. Lucia. So the discussions in the Bahamas was excellent. I think that was an opportunity for a lot of the ministers to come together and really discuss the problems. The Latin American countries like Brazil and Argentina, they are faced with similar crises and they are willing to share experiences, share knowledge with small island states like St. Lucia to ensure that we address this food security crisis head on. I just wanted to make one announcement to our farmers. You would recall that my Prime Minister led a delegation to Venezuela over the last two weeks, and we have been told that some level of assistance in the form of fertilizer will be granted to our farmers. What a timely opportunity for us to increase our food production, because there is a call for increasing production of our food in St. Lucia because in some cases when you go to mass you see the supermarket shelves are empty. I know persons, some persons, especially those on the other side, seem to deliberately not remember that we had a storm in June and as a result our planting and subsectors were devastated and as a result it is responsible for what you see on the supermarket shelves. But I guarantee St. Lucians that in the next few weeks, we will see more food on our supermarket shelves. But that is not to say that we do not have other challenges in the agricultural sector in St. Lucia. And in the next week or so, I plan to bring together key farmers, key producers in the sector to discuss the challenge faced in terms of the agricultural sector, the, our food security, and more importantly, our food import bill. It is very important that we continue to encourage our farmers to produce, 
continue to give them the support that they require to produce. Because at the end of the day, we must be food secure and we must make a drastic effort to reduce our food import bill by encouraging farmers to produce what we eat, to grow what we eat, and to eat what we grow. My question is about um, agro-processing. Um, what has been done to strengthen linkages between the farmers who produce their um, material and the business sector um, to develop further products, so like turning cocoa into chocolate and that type of thing? What has been done by the ministry? Well, if you were not aware, yesterday we had a, a cocoa festival in Soufre. Mm -hmm. And I was in, in the um, parliamentary reps constituency. And I came off a flight at about 3 o'clock and I headed down there. And I was able to see the connection between the farmers and what was produced. You, 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 would, you, would be able to go, you would be able to see a lot of the products made out of cocoa. You, there was the cocoa, I think, soaps and a number of other product, products. I think it does well for us in the agro-processing subsector. But what I'm concerned about is every time I ask those persons I visited yesterday or the vendors I visited yesterday, the question is, can I get those products on the supermarket shelves? And they will say no. So we still have a lot to do in terms of, you know, getting to the next level. We had a cassava and coconut festival in Miku a few months ago. We've had a banana festival. We, have, we had Simos festival. We had mango festivals, but that is one level of exposing them, getting to know who they are, getting to understand the challenges. But what I think is important is for us to take it to the next level. But what is important in doing that is that food standards must be extremely high. You want to ensure that you have a product that is safe for consumption, and at the end of the day, you want to be able to ensure that our citizens, our visitors, can go to any Massey store, any other supermarket, and be able to get those products on those shelves. A lot of persons are operating from home, which is a concern. I want to ensure that we work together with commerce and the other players, the other partners, health, and get to see a lot of the products on the supermarket shelves and in turn exporting those products to other countries. I have another question about um, diversification. Um, <coughs> what are the plans to get some, non, some more non-traditional um, I guess, plants um, into St. Lucia. So um, I know that we, will, we are generally have heavily reliant on bananas and these type of things. But what are some of the plants to get some non-traditional um, crops? As I mentioned earlier, the, the agricultural sector is challenged by a number of factors. And this is necessary and important to build a resilient agricultural sector. That is key. Because climate change, you do not know when it's coming to an end and it will continue to have an impact on the sector. And that is why it's important for us to diversify the agricultural sector. I'm not in any way saying to you that bananas is not important because bananas continue and will continue to impact the rural areas of St. Lucia. We still have over 2,000 plus acres of bananas on St. Lucia. We still have more than 300 plus farmers involved directly in banana production. And if you multiply 300 farmers by, let's say, four persons, you know, in a, in a family. You're talking 1,000 plus people who still heavily depends on the agriculture, on, on bananas. So what we need to do is to get into other um, forms of agriculture like cassava, and I'm hoping that we will be putting a, a, a new spending request together to get into cassava production. We have a cocoa project that we are currently implementing. We are hoping that we can increase the acreage of cocoa by 2,250 hectares, sorry. And we are hoping that we can get more persons into that kind of production. We believe it is important because agriculture is not only about bananas. You would understand what happened to our banana market in the UK recently, but there is still tremendous potential in the region for our bananas. As I said before, our target was 15,000 boxes per week and we're only about 7,500. So I see tremendous potential, but you're right. We are encouraging a number of other crops in agriculture that I believe has the potential for us to continue the diversification process because that is the only way we're gonna be food secure. And don't forget the seven crops program is aimed at increasing production of those commodities in an effort to reduce our imports on those seven crops. Um, we are aware that
that urea fertilizer, we are about to expect that for our farmers. Um, food security is a major issue here. So can we expect any more results from this Venezuela meeting? Well, we have a meeting tomorrow. So we had the meeting, the ministerial meeting with the PM and everybody else at this Zoom meeting last week. It has gotten to the technical part where tomorrow my technical team and the technical team in Venezuela will meet um, um, via Zoom to discuss the fertilizer issue. So what I'm told is that we will be getting 2,000 tons of the fertilizer and 2,000 tons of fertilizer will be equivalent to 40,000 bags of fertilizer. Now, what we have done is we, we've, we've conducted research on our soils on the project called the Moroccan Soils Project, and we have put together a list of those fertilizer blends that we require in St. Lucia based on results coming from the soils research that was done. That has been submitted to the team in Venezuela. So you will see blends like a mixture of phosphorus and potassium, a mixture of urea or, or sulfate of ammonia. So there are different blends based on the results coming from our soils. So it's not a case where we're just bringing in fertilizer and we do not know what, is it, what the impact would be on soil. So I'm just going to make it clear again, it will not be 40,000 bags of urea it would be urea mixed with various blends of other fertilizer types. Good morning, members of the press. Good morning, St. Lucia. Um, my first comment as, min as the Minister for Commerce um, concerns the issue of price control on sanitary napkins. Okay, so the Minister of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives and Consumer Affairs wishes to inform the general public that effective October 23rd, 2023 until August 1st, 2025, sanitary napkins will be price controlled. This action became necessary after an impact study conducted by the Consumer Affairs Department of the ministry reveal that the prices of these essential items did not reflect the expected 12.5% reduction in VAT implemented by the government of St. Lucia from August 2nd, 2023. Consequently, the cabinet of ministers approved an amendment to the price control order to add sanitary napkins to the list of price control items. The cabinet further approved a maximum wholesale market price of 30% and a maximum retail price, market price of 35% on these items. The Consumer Affairs Department of the Ministry of Commerce will continue to provide guidance to the business community to ensure compliance and invite consumers to contact the department at 468 4239 or 468 4226 should you have any queries. Okay. Tampons are not included, just tampons. I said tampons are not included in this. It's just the uh, napkins. Sanitary products. So tampons would include tampons. it would include that. For all all of them? Yes. Sorry, the press release said sanitary napkins. Sanitary napkins specifically, but so there's some products in there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about uh, national minimum wage. Um, national minimum wage? Well, uh, I, I was aware that, that the government was trying to establish a, a minimum wage, right? Um, we do understand how it would benefit employees, but also I'm thinking about people who, are, who start up businesses, um, entrepreneurs. Um, do you what challenges do you foresee that that would pose to them and um, how can the government help balance out these challenges? Well, um, I'm glad you asked that question, but first the Minister, of, the minister responsible for Labour, mm -hmm. uh, Honourable Virginia Poyer, to deal with the issue of, of this. But from a business perspective, 
um, you would re realize that up to now, the Ministry of Finance is helping us do the economic review that is required so that we see what impact it would have on the business community. That is why we have taken a little time before we come out to see exactly how we are going to roll out a minimum wage because it's going to impact different parts of the business community in different ways. But the um, government is very mindful of its impact on the business community. So we continue to work. We have our technocrats at the Ministry of Finance working with Ministry of Commerce as well as Ministry of Labor to ensure that the research that is done um, is one that is going to impact all the stakeholders, being business persons as well as the employees. I need to make a statement as it relates to my role as a parliamentary rep for Soufre for Shejat. As you know, our team, Soufre United, um, won the Black Hats trophy. And what we did on Friday, what I did on Friday was to bring my team together to thank them on behalf of the Soufre community. That went very well. Um, also, in, in the area of sports, on Thursday evening, the Sufra Regional Development Foundation um, sponsored the, um, our team, Sufra Stampers, for the SPL series. I'm saying so to tell you that within the Sufra Foshesha constituency, we place significant efforts and focus on our youth and the area of sports. So we will continue um, relaying to you the progress that we're making. That's in the area of sports, as in the area of Jeune Creole. You also know that Soufre is a host community, and our approach for um, observance of Moi Creole was to have the events and activities throughout the month. So we started with uh, events at Fongelib. Um, we followed that with the Sunday at Bouton. And last weekend we did, um, Saturday we had Zeno. And yesterday, Sunday, we had um, Creole, the Coco Festival in Soufre. And what we're going to have next weekend, God willing, we are going to have the entire weekend up in Fonchin Jacques. We have a competition and everything else. This is followed by the following weekend where we have the actual Junior Creole celebration. Tuesday, which is uh, tomorrow, God willing, we are going to have our Margaret Festival um, with our schools in Soufre. We are celebrating that as well. But we also want to tell um, St. Lucia that we are culminating the entire month by going into the first Sunday of November. And there we have what you call Kudme Soufriye, where we are trying to get all the communities to come out and, and do Kudme within the community to clean, to beautify, and to bring that whole spirit of self-help back into our community. I take this moment to thank all of St. Lucia who have come in yesterday, we had uh, persons from all over. I want to thank you for participating and supporting. And I want to tell you that the people of Soufre continue to look forward to embracing you with feet on love. Okay, so we look forward to celebrating the month. My lady, merci. Et puis, bon moi, héritage Creole pour toute cette lycée. Also, yesterday was International Day for Rural Women. So I want to take this moment to recognize the efforts of our rural women in their role in terms of entrepreneurs, as well as farmers, and as well as citizens who have stayed and kept the fort. Today, 16th, is World Food Day, and I think our minister maybe forgot, I'm not sure if he mentioned that but it's also World Food Day. It's an important day for us persons in terms of the whole issue of food security. So again, I want to raise that consciousness 
among all of St. Lucians that we need to eat what we grow and grow what we eat. Nutrition is important for us. The school system and you members of the press, please do all you can because you are the mouthpiece of all of us to continue encouraging our citizens to eat what we grow and grow what we eat and to eat fresh St. Lucia best. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Edward, Acting Prime Minister, Minister of Education, Sustainable Development, Innovation, Science, Technology, Vocational Training, and perhaps one of the most important in all of this is Parliamentary Representative for Denry North. Okay, Mr. Lisa, as Parliamentary Representative for Denry North. Um, over the weekend, we had a number of incidents, including one homicide in your constituency. What can you talk to the young people? And I'm just getting report there is another one in them, you said. Concern of gun violence and everything happening. What do you say? Well, first of all, um, let me say that our government denounces violence. Um, we are not happy with where we are at as a country in terms of the level of criminality um, we see happening in St. Lucia at the moment. Um, but as the Prime Minister would have said previously, ours is a role where we provide oversight. We will continue to equip the police and the other agencies with the resources to ensure that they execute their mandates in way that, ways that will make St. Lucia a more peaceful place where citizens can coexist with each other. Um, as it relates to the killing in the Denry Basin, um, I have to emphatically denounce that act of violence and I should profit the opportunity to implore not just residents of Denry, but St. Lucians across the length and breadth of this country to look for amicable ways to resolve conflicts and not turn to violence as we've seen happening in, in our country um, in the last couple of months. But what are you doing? Because it seems to be in your constituency and concerns over the last couple of months. Um, I know it's been some, but then it has been a hot day. Are you doing any dangers? What are, what are you, what are you talking, are you talking to your people? Are you talking? Well, I'm just coming out of a meeting with um, a member of the High Command of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. We were not looking at Denry specifically, but we are particularly concerned with what is happening in every pocket, every nook and cranny. And we continue to make resources available to the police, empower the police. Um, just a little over a year or less than a year ago, we went to Parliament to enact legislation where the police were given special powers to make interventions to try and curb the crime situation. So we're not happy with it. As I said, um, it is worrying and we know of the adverse consequences that crime and criminality can have on our country from an economic standpoint, a social standpoint. And that is why we'll continue to make the resources available, work col collaboratively with social partners to try and bring that situation under control. And in relation to crime, recently we just understand that um, social I don't have details, yes, but it has been brought to my attention that somebody did burglarize the offices of the Sustainable Development Department. I don't have details in terms of the, the extent of the damage, but yes, that was brought to my attention and I'm reliably informed that the police, they are on the scene and hopefully later today I will get a comprehensive report in terms of what transpired. So what the staff and then? Um, I cannot speak to the um, staff. At the time that it happened, from what I was told, um, there was nobody on, on the premises. But um, as I said, the police, they are there conducting their investigation. And hopefully by the end of today, I'll be in a position to speak more authoritatively on what transpired. No, I don't have a statement. I'm taking questions. I don't know if you could speak through the... Um that um, football battle that has to between UNESCO and St. Lucia in us trying to maintain our the Pitor status as a World Heritage Site. Um, if you could give us the date this will be happening, um, the team who's spearheading that, uh, yeah. that thing. And yeah. I, I, noticed there was a I noticed there was a report in the media last week um, where the point was made that we were under threat of losing our World Heritage status. Um, that is the Pitor management area. Let me say that that information is erroneous. Um, there's no imminent threat to St. Lucia losing the heritage status that we currently enjoy. There was a meeting of UNESCO convened in Saudi Arabia last month and St. Lucia was represented at that meeting and based on the reports coming out of that particular meeting, as I said, there is no imminent threat. But what I can tell you is that we have to control development within the PMA 
Um, very recently, there's a private landowner in the PMA who wanted to embark on a particular project, which we believe um, can adversely affect the status that we currently enjoy. And it was against that backdrop as a government, we, we took a position where we, we were opposed to it as a cabinet. Um, but it wasn't the cabinet that, that really went out there fighting it. Um, the DCA, in their, their wisdom, wisdom, sorry, they did not uphold the application for the development. Um, the matter was taken to court. Um, the government of St. Lucia, we, we, we were not successful in, in that particular um, court matter. But we have appealed the decision of, of the court. And even before that second hearing is, is, is convened, we as an administration, we are speaking with international partners to see what can be done to ensure that we safeguard the world heritage status that we currently enjoy. This means a lot to St. Lucia, this means a lot to the people of Sufre, and we will spare absolutely no effort whatsoever to ensure that we preserve the heritage status that we currently enjoy. We understand that a lot of the lands within the demarcated areas that constitute the PMA belong to private owners. And if it is that we have to acquire lands or do whatever is possible within the legal framework, we will do so. But for us, the priority of this Philip J. Pellet administration is that to, we will preserve at all costs um, the current world heritage status we enjoy with UNESCO. So there's no battle? There's no battle with UNESCO. Um, I think if, if there is a battle, um, it really is with maybe private property owners um, and it's not about battle. We've been speaking to them, trying to dissuade certain developments, but people have a right to resort to the courts um, to make their, their point. And as I said, the matter was brought before the court. Um, we, didn't, we were not successful in the first round, and it is as a result of the importance we ascribe to the PMA that we have decided to appeal. We will spend millions of dollars if we have to in the court process, but our priority as a government is to ensure that the current world heritage status we enjoy with the PMA that will be preserved and I'm very confident moving forward that um, we will retain our world heritage status for many, many years to come. But, but, but it calls for a lot of engagement, it calls for a lot of dialogue. Um, we have to continue to impress upon the minds of residents in Sufre and even property owners within the PMA, show them the significance of that particular um, accolade for our country. And we're hoping that, um, as I said, we will be successful in, in ensuring that we preserve the world heritage status that we currently enjoy. One of the things that came out of that, um, that case, the, the court hearing, um, was the judge saying that there was no, I guess, legal backing to back up you know, your defense. So is there plans to probably legislate um, development or? Um, the, I don't want to get into details, um, because as we say in law, um, the matter is subjudicated, meaning that it is still very active. So any legal pronouncement on that, I would defer to the Attorney General. But what I can tell you, as the Minister responsible for sustainable development and as a member of the Cabinet, that we are committed uh, against the odds, using all resources at our disposal, technical, human, financial, to ensure that there is preservation of the world heritage status that we currently enjoy. There were some events in your Yes, yes. I must say I'm extremely pleased with the effort in Denrinov as it relates to the Mabuya Valley hosting Juné Creole 2023. Um, we have a very well put together committee or team spearheading the effort. Um, it really it comprises members of different community-based organizations, of course, ably assisted by some technocrats from government, the CDF, um, events and Russia, etc. So far, the events that they've executed have been tremendously successful. Um, last weekend, there was a seance, a La Marguerite seance in Rich Fournier Falco's Bar. Um, based on the footage, I was not here, but based on the footage that was shared, um, I can tell you it was a resounding success. Um, I think that same weekend or a few days later, there was uh, an activity in the Fonpiti River in Upper Denia Riviere. And again, the, the number of participants and the persons who actually reside outside of the valley who came in just to witness it speaks to the level of organization we've been enjoying as it relates to our preparation for Juné Creole 2023. So I'm happy with where we are at. And I want to probably profit the opportunity to ask St. Lucians. I know you have a choice in terms of where you would want to celebrate Juné Creole. I invite you to come to the Mabuya Valley because I am certain there you will have the most authentic product. And we have done it before. And we were extremely successful in hosting. And I see no reason why this year 
we should not expect ex exceed sorry the lofty standards that we have set as it relates to hosting Junior Creole in the past. I have been the parliamentary I have been the parliamentary representative for Denry North since the general election of 2011. And after three general elections, the people have retained me as the individual to give voice to the aspirations of the people within the Mabuya Valley. And ever since we were returned to government um, after the 2021 general election, um, people have been asking for projects and to see certain infrastructural developments in the community. I'm happy to report this morning that I have, in conversation with my constituents, made the point time and again that there's more to development than just concrete and steel. And so in Denry North, the average constituent can speak to a very robust, a very aggressive social program where we are assisting people with scholarships, we're providing back to school assistance, we're helping um, provide medical support, we are assisting the farmers with farm implements and things of that sort, because we understand those are important. And there has been a deliberate effort to push an agenda of human resource development and opportunities for higher education. So today as we speak, you will find young persons from the Mabuya Valley, from Denry North, attending universities across the globe. And almost everywhere in the world where you have St. Lucians um, acquiring higher education, you have people from Denry North um, um, in, in that mix. And I'm extremely pleased for that. And I would have said to my people that they needed to be patient um, to see the rolling out of an infrastructure program. This morning, I'm happy to report to the press that as we speak, the plans have been finalized for the commencement of the Austin Hill Road, which had been kept in abeyance um, by the previous administration. As we speak, work has started on the Tila Resource Road. The contract has been signed. As we speak, the contracts for the Ampatat Road in Lapel, that has been, the contracts have been signed. And only this morning, I was handed the bill of quantities um, for the La Resource Health Center by the Minister of Health. And prior to coming to Cabinet today, I had a conversation with the Prime Minister, who is currently out of state, where the Austin, the La Resource Health Center, um, the contract will be signed and work will start within the month of October. So I want to just profit the opportunity to thank the people of Denry North for their patience. And as I would have said to them, um, there's absolutely no way we will not get our fair share of the national pie as it relates to infrastructure projects. The Prime Minister has indicated that he is putting together a comprehensive um, road rehabilitation project. And I know that as a constituency, Denry North will benefit because you must look at that against the backdrop of my stint in opposition, where there was a deliberate policy um, by the previous administration to starve opposition parliamentarians of state resources. I did not have the ability as an MP who was duly elected by the people of Denry North to procure a single bag of cement in five plus years. I did not preside over a single CDP, Constituency Development Program. That's a program where parliamentary reps are able to identify projects in their constituencies that they can provide oversight for their execution. We, six of us in opposition, we had no such um, privilege. And today I'm happy to report that the CDP is back and that we, we are getting our fair share. And I'm extremely pleased with where we are at and moving forward, um, things can only look brighter for the constituents of Denry North as it relates to a, a, a program that is nicely balanced with infrastructure works and social interventions, of course, working collaboratively with the Ministry of Equity, the SSDF, and all the other state um, agencies that operate within the realm of social development and community de development. That's mine. Thank you. So our final speaker, Honorable Joachim Henry, Minister for Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment, will address us. Good morning, members of the press. Um, hope you had a good weekend. Um, I'm here to share with you basically um, the activity which took place last week as it relates to the opening of a, of a um, social housing project in my constituency in Four Club, but under the auspices of the um, St. Lucia Social Development Fund. Um, most of you would, would, would recognize that we do have a social housing program within the, within the Ministry of Housing. We provide persons with materials. 
But this particular project is one that is different, and I wish to report to you that um, I think it's one that we should take note of. Not only that it's a, it's a duplex, um, but it's a project built on crown lands for persons who for persons who the, the Seventh Adventist Church and the Blind Welfare Association will identify. These individuals will only have lifetime enjoyment. What has happened in the past when government um, build a home for somebody who is vulnerable? Um, it's expected that the person would have lifetime enjoyment. But because of change of administration, you find that the person would pass on and then family members who never cared for, that person would now come and occupy. And there are many government interventions around St. Lucia where um, maybe Crown Lands is aware, but most persons would not be aware that are really Crown government property or taxpayers' intervention that is being enjoyed by subsequent generation without it actually coming back practically to government. So this one in particular is, is very unique and of course according to Pastor Stephen, um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church who worked with us, he said it's first time in history that it's happening, that the Adventist Church would remain the, um, the steward over, over the building where the, the, the individuals who are housed in this, in this property are actually persons who are in need or who are destitute, who are homeless. When these individuals passed, um, God forbid, then somebody else will 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 move in um, under the guidance of the church and the Blind Welfare Association, who is also partner to this. But very important is the fact that this building is built out of four-inch blocks and not six-inch blocks because it's a low-cost intervention. And I think it's important for us to understand that as well, that is built on grade, not on columns. It's cheaper to build on grade than to suspend the floor. And when you says when you build on the on grid on on the ground, once your your the ground is solid, you do not need a heavy concrete floor. Um, and I remind some of my colleagues that even the strongest um, areas where you have heavy traffic do not have concrete floors. They're basically asphalt on a solid um, road surface. So if a home where you have just pedestrian walking and you really do not need to have an expensive heavy concrete to suspend or to support individuals walking in the house and the furniture. There is what you call the, the live load and dead load. So this intervention is a, is a, is a model. It's, it's pioneered in, 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 for, in um, for, for Maji, um, that's next to, to Marigo, and it actually provides a very low-cost intervention out of concrete that um, the, the concrete block's compressive strength of a four-inch is, is as near as that of a six-inch block wall. Um, so there's no fear in building a home out of four-inch blocks. And for those of you who may contemplate having a cheaper option, you, um, some buildings in other parts of the world are built out of four-inch. The Martinique, I see they use a lot of four-inch bricks and not six-inch bricks to build homes. So we really have an example of a, of a model of a, of a low-cost intervention that is sustainable and that meets the other um, consideration in having it remain with St. Lucians um, or the, the investment is protected by having a third party involved. Um, that being said, I also need to inform you that we continue to look for areas of support for a vulnerable population. Of course, you would have heard that the Prime Minister has removed um, the, the cost for, for ambulances on, on um, for our people, but also um, not taking any thunder from pronouncement, but I know we are also discussing the issue of removing or reducing significantly the cost of having um, fire reports from the fire from the fire service for fire victims. Um, it was two hundred dollars, and sometimes when somebody a fire victim is unable to come up with two hundred dollars to pay for a fire report, so that they can get their package from 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 the the, the Red Cross or wherever they they need to get it. If they need lose their passport or their ID card, they would need a fire report. That has been reduced, I think, to just about $50 instead of $200. So all of these areas, and we continue to identify as a, as a ministry, as a ministry of equity, areas that, that are challenging to our population, to our vulnerable population, so that things become easier and better. Yes, sir. Yes, previously you mentioned an initiative about revamping the Boys Training Center. I know there's any progress made on that. Yes. Um, the, we are moving forward. Of course, we had a meeting last week with the um, Caribbean Development Bank um, in terms of um, arranging to put the necessary 
funding in this year's budget to allocate resources for us to move forward. What was allocated is really funds for the for the architectural component, but we didn't want to just um, proceed with um, a design that is not based on consultation with stakeholders. Questions must be answered as to how will how will we incorporate or should we incorporate both girls and boys, in a in a and not just have a. a a boys training center, but a juvenile center that caters for both sexes. Um, the, the centers we have visited in the region, they have both, you know, young boys and young ladies and they manage them as well. Um, it's costing us quite a bit to have, you know, six managers managing three juvenile centers, you know, and each of them approximately have 10 children or, or, or 20 for the most. So you have probably 15 at the boys training center, you have at the at the Upton Girls, probably about 15, and at the Transit Home, you have another maybe 10 or 12. These are different institutions, but we need to have that kind of consultation so that the professionals will guide us. That Certainly, I, I find it's heavy on taxpayers for you to have these three groups of young people, yet you, um, the taxpayers are paying six managers, one assistant, one manager and assistant manager in the three organizations. So we need to rationalize that, but we cannot just do it. We need to do it with um, consultation, and what cabinet has has done is to approve the the group that will oversee and that would ad advise us based on what is world standard, the best standard for doing a juvenile centre, and that the architect will use as a brief in guiding the design. You know, so we um, we need to move very careful with this, and therefore we we going to start the consultation, bring in the architect. We have identified the architect, but that. The, the group of individuals, social practitioners, people from, from um, probation, police officers, um, the ex-officers um, of the Boys Training Center and the other professionals who have worked in that, and those who are informed, to speak to what is ideal, what is best, so that we provide a, the best um, juvenile center for our young people in St. Lucia.